Okay, in this lesson, we're going to talk about uh, some very specific groups on our periodic table and what they are. So as you see them pop up here, we have lots of different names for areas in our periodic table. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, hydrogen is kind of in a group by itself. It kind of has, kind of hangs out. It might be considered one of those other nonmetals, but um, kind of is by itself here uh, in terms of how it works. Sometimes you see hydrogen actually grouped also with this group, but it's not official. Okay. Um, so let's kind of go through the names of our different groups. So all of the metals in group one are called alkali metals, okay, except for hydrogen. In group two, we call them alkaline earth metals. All of these metals in this lower block here, we give the term transition metals to them. The group down here, inner transition metals. Now, in this area here, we have that stair-step line that separates our metals and our non-metals. So those metals under the stair step line, we just call metals under the stair step. These non-metals that are above the stair step line, a lot of times we just call them the other non-metals, okay? Meaning other from the two other columns. This group 17 here is denoted as our halogens. And then our very last group, we call them our noble gases, okay? Now, we're gonna hit these four groups in particular, the alkaline metals, the alkaline earth metals, the halogens, and the noble gases in more detail. The rest of them we'll kind of talk about as time goes on individually as things work through that. Okay, so here we go. So first of all, the alkaline metals. Now when we look at the reactivity on our periodic table, the ends of the periodic table are our most reactive. Okay, we don't want to say that one side is more than the other, but what we want to say is that if you're looking at the very far left-hand side of the table, these alkaline metals are going to be our most reactive metals, okay? Um, we do want to exclude hydrogen from here, even though hydrogen is very reactive. Um, looking at the metals, they're all very silvery in nature, okay? And if we start to compare them to other metals, okay? So, like, how do we know what, what's unique about alkaline metals, all right? Well, think about it. First of all, we should go back to their electron configuration. And they have only one electron in that outer energy level, okay? Which means they're gonna form a one plus ion when they, when they form charges, all right? Um, they're gonna get rid of that one valence electron that they have, which is very common for them. Because they ionize the same way, they also have very similar properties to each other, okay? So what are those properties? Well, first of all, they're highly reactive in water. All right, so when you place them in water, they're going to form a very quick, very strong, very aggressive reaction with water um, to a point where it actually can ignite uh, the gases that are produced there or explode. All right, uh, they also react in air to oxidize. Okay, so if you leave them out in air, they actually will pull the oxygen out of the air and create a chemical reaction and undergo oxidation. Of our metals, they're very soft. Okay. Um, in fact, if you took like potassium and put it between your fingers and squished it, you could squish it like a pat of butter kind of deal. Um, we wouldn't do that because potassium reacts with water and our fingers have moisture in it. So we could potentially burn ourselves uh, and it would actually start to react with the water in our skin uh, to touch it. So we will never touch it. But if you did touch it, it's very, very soft. Okay. And then comparative to other metals, it also has a very low melting point. Okay. Um, so there's a kind of a range here, but this is kind of a comparison between these different metals, okay? So biggest thing for alkali metals is realizing that they're the, the most reactive of our metals, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that it only has one electron to give up to become stable, okay? They're also our biggest metals, right? So in terms of size, they're going to be the biggest ones across our periodic table by row, okay? Um, which creates this high reactivity, this oxidation, how soft they are in their melting points and so forth. All right, that's our alkaline metals. We'll have a demonstration on them uh, in class. Now, the next group over, we call the alkaline earth metals. That's group two, okay? So because we move one step to the right, we have similar properties of the alkaline metals, but just subdued a little bit, okay? And it's subdued because they're a little bit smaller. They're not quite as big as the alkaline metals. And... Um, in this case, they have two electrons they are going to give up to form ions, which means by moving two electrons at a time, it just takes more energy to move two electrons versus one electron. So don't, things don't happen quite as aggressively as you would see with an alkali metal. Okay, but if we continue to compare them to let's say to let's say the alkali metals, okay, we're compare them to the alkali metals. 
um, they're going to have higher melting points. So in comparison to Alchemeros, still have higher melting points, okay? Less reactive, okay? However, they're still reactive enough where you're never going to find these metals around in nature without being a compound, okay? So you're never going to find just calcium metal laying around or magnesium metal laying around. They're always going to be bound into some compound. Now, you can purify magnesium, and we do that for some industrial reasons, and you can purify calcium and those other metals, but you're, they're not going to naturally find it that way, okay? So they're reactive enough still to oxidize in air and create compounds, okay? Just not as aggressive as alkali metals, okay? They're going to be harder and more dense than the alkali metals are too, okay? Now, in comparison to the other metals, like the transition metals or those metals under the stair step, they're still relatively soft, relatively low melting points, but they're kind of like a step into the next layer of these kind of properties, okay? So kind of keep that in mind in terms of reactivity. Even though they're not the most reactive group of metals, they're still more reactive than most metals, okay? They're still softer. They still have lower melting points and that kind of stuff, all right? Um, it's just the alkaline metals, group one, is even more so between those things, all right? So those are our alkaline earth metals. We study alkaline metals and alkaline earth metals a lot in here because of their high reactivity. So they produce some really cool compounds for us to talk about as the year goes on. All right, and those are all those guys there. Now, we're gonna shift gears and go way to the other side of the periodic table. So we're going to group 17 or our halogens, all right? So now we're talking about this group of halogens and for these, they're all non-metals in this group, and they're, as a non-metal, they're the most reactive non-metals, okay? You might be thinking, wait a minute, there's a group to the right of halogens, right? There's a group 18. Isn't group 18 going to be our most reactive? And actually, they're not. We'll talk about the noble gases here in a minute, but the noble gases are not reactive at all, okay? So as a group, the halogens are going to be our most reactive non-metals, okay? So we have super reactive metals, alkaline metals, and we have super reactive non-metals, halogens, right? Both are kind of bookends to the whole periodic table because as you move to left and right, you get more reactive substances, okay? Taking a look at the halogens, okay? The term halogen actually comes from a, I'm not sure of the origins, but it means salt former, all right? And originally, when we talked about salts in the sciences or in chemistry in particular, anything that formed compounds with halogens, we considered salts. Okay? Now that definition has changed a little bit. And if you say the word salt in common day speech, you're thinking of sodium chloride, like table salt. But really, you can have other salts that have halogens in them. Okay? So we still kind of use that idea, but it's just not as, as formal as it used to be. All right? Again, we've talked about them being highly reactive, highest of all our nonmetals. All right. Now, what makes them so reactive? Okay. So the halogens have seven electrons in that outer energy level. So instead of losing electrons, the halogens can gain a single electron to become stable. So again, it's only a movement of one electron that allows them to get stability. So that one electron is really easy to move around. It takes less energy. On top of that, the halogens are our smallest atoms, okay, in that row. So if you go from a, a row, across a row, the alkali metals are our biggest, which means it's easy for them to lose electrons. The halogens are our smallest, which means it's easy for them to gain an electron. Kind of like opposites affecting there, right, that idea. So they're super reactive because they're really good at gaining electrons um, and forming compounds, all right? Now... What's interesting about halogens is they form diatomics, and we'll talk more about that in our next slide, okay? But we do want to also talk about how halogens, because of their reactivity, they're also known for cleaning and disinfection, okay? So things like bromine, maybe in like hot tubs or pools, that kind of stuff. Chlorine, as in like bleach. Chlorine isn't found in bleach, that kind of stuff. Those things were good for cleaning those things. Even fluorides in terms of cleaning, like keeping your teeth from uh, uh, decay, that kind of stuff. So the halogens have properties of known to be kind of like a cleaner or disinfectant and are used that way in our society, okay? Interesting thing with the halogens, we have chlorine gas up here. This is bromine liquid, and we have iodine solid down here, okay? So it's interesting. They're all non-metals, but they're not all gases at room temperature. In fact, we only have two liquids on our periodic table at room temperature, and one is bromine and the other is mercury. Um, besides that, everything else is either a solid or gas on the periodic table. Kind of cool. Let's dive back into this idea of diatomics, okay, for halogens. So diatomic elements are kind of unique 
And what they do is, because halogens are so reactive, they want to bond with themselves to form a molecule. And we discussed that a little bit earlier this year already. Okay. Now, your most reactive nonmetals, because a lot of time they're in a gaseous state or a liquid state or are able to connect, connect with each other, they actually pair up. And we call those that pairing a diatomic. Okay. We have seven of them, and these are seven you need to put to memory. So what I would do is, on your pre table, I would actually either like, like put a border around these seven, or I would um, maybe put a little tube underneath them to remind you that these are diatomics, okay? Now, they're not all halogens, but halogens are diatomics. So if we take a look, we have fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Those are all our diatomics, but we also want to add three more. So oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. And you'll notice how oxygen and nitrogen are on that first row of the periodic table, uh, with that first that first uh, group going across there, or period. Um, so again, they're relatively small atoms, are very reactive. So even though they're not considered halogens, they also are very reactive, like you would think uh, the halogens are. Okay. The beauty is for me, I always remember the seven because the the seven diatomics actually make a seven on the periodic table. And yeah, you gotta use your imagination a little bit, but nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, they make the seven. And then if you get a little creative, the hydrogen kind of acts as the number sign on that. So if you think about it, the number seven is the indicator of your halogens and all your diatomics, okay? So make a note of that because moving from here on out, when we work with chemical reactions, we're gonna assume that you know that these come in pairs all the time, okay? Now, that brings us to our last of our um, groups that we're going to study in more detail, okay? So we've done the alkaline metals, we've done the alkaline earth metals, halogens, and now the noble gases. Okay, so noble gases, they are on the far, far, far right-hand side of our periodic table. And what's unique about them is that they're non-reactive, okay? Uh, we actually say that they're inert, meaning they don't react with any other elements. And if you think about why they act that way, is because the noble gases, they fill all the electrons that they need to in their outer energy level or that valence energy level, okay? You probably heard of the octet rule potentially in previous classes. So because they have two electrons in their s orbital and six electrons in that p orbital, that two s and that six p together give us eight electrons or eight valence electrons, which then fills their outer energy level. Now, once you have a full outer energy level, that's the ultimate of stability. So we have the most stable elements on the very, very, very far right-hand side of our table. So because they're so stable, because they don't react with anything, we call them noble gases. Okay? It's kind of like back in the old, the old medieval times, right, where nobility didn't interact with the peasants and people below them because they didn't need to. right? They had everything they wanted. Why would they interact with people below them? Kind of the same concept where they're nobility, they're noble gases, so they don't need to. All right. Now, that doesn't mean we don't use them for things in our society. Okay. Noble gases are used for things. Okay. Uh, they're used in neon lighting, which is kind of cool. It gives us those different kind of things. Uh, helium is used because it's a really light gas in a lot of aspects for trying to make things like balloons and other things like that. In fact, um, we use argon uh, in when you're working with metallurgy because argon is non-reactive. So sometimes you actually will do chemistry or torching or working with metals. Instead of having air in the chamber, you actually will re remove the air and pump argon gas in instead. Argon's a really heavy air. It's a really heavy gas. So it'll actually will push normal air out of any chamber to fill it. And now you have an inert gas around wherever you're working on. So Essentially, argon is used to replace oxygen and nitrogen and hydrogen and other gases if you don't want them to be part of a reaction. So argon is often used uh, as a way to like create an environment that is the air around it, and now we're using the word air kind of loosely here, but the argon around it is no longer air and it's non-reactive. So the chemistry only happens with the chemicals you're putting in. Kind of cool. Okay. There's other practical uses for these two, but that's just kind of like some examples of how noble gases are used. Okay. And again, we don't want to forget they have those eight outer electrons, which makes them stable. All right. With stability, they're not going to react.